this whole you know iteration and this is sort of in some respect is kind of like lean uh, you know, product development where you iterate, test it, iterate, you know, like that. How did you keep your, I mean, obviously you had some of your money in this, but you also had investor money in it. How did you keep them engaged in believing in the concept to get to this point? Well, uh, I would say that if you were to go interview some of our early investors that they might not have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Keeping keeping the, the the dream alive has been an interesting trick. Um, I I was the the early investor in the company, sort of seed funded it uh, all the way through the first three generations. Um, but then I, I exhausted my own personal resources and and had to go out and start telling the story elsewhere. Right. Uh, and and it it. Getting the you know sort of bringing together those resources has been a real trick because if you think back to you know 2009 2010 um, this was just after the financial collapse venture capital uh, had basically evaporated and not only that uh, clean tech was um, starting to take a real beating with things like Solyndra um, and it the you just watched all of the other vehicle companies, uh, EV companies in our cohort, who had actually done very well with fundraising in 2006, 2007, uh, you know, Fisker, uh, Aptera, Coda, um, you just kind of go down the list. Right. Even Tesla was up against the ropes, but everyone else just got wiped out. Um, and so, uh, you know, going into the fundraising conversation saying, you know, yeah, I made video games, now I'm gonna make an electric vehicle, and oh, by the way, you know, we're very different from everyone else who's just gotten completely destroyed. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a trick. I, I we had a just a number of uh, a number of folks who came in, and and one really believed in our mission in terms of developing, uh, not aiming for uh, a, a a niche product for the very well off, but really aiming for something from day one that would be accessible by the mass market. Um, and then we just demonstrated continuous improvement throughout the throughout the process. Okay, well, give us a quick rundown on the on the on the Gen Eight. I mean, how is where are you at now in terms of performance on that and price and uh, things? It's 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 great. Um, I you know, and I I obviously a little biased. You're biased. <laughs> yeah, we just so we Gen Eight was a sketch in December of last year. Uh, we kept all of our same uh, basic platform layout, drivetrain, battery system, all that stayed the same from Gen 7 to Gen 8. So it wasn't you know, a complete start over from scratch, but it was a, a fairly substantial um, industrial design, redesign, and certainly a, a total control system redesign. So we had, it was a, it was a sketch in December, uh, it was a, a Decent looking uh, 3D render in uh, March. We had the the sort of full model of the mule put together in um, June, and actually had it on the road in August in an engineering test mule form. Uh, based on what we learned from that, we've now built two more uh, what we're calling the alpha prototypes. So where the mule was really just a, a, a raw cage, you know, very rough from a, from a visual standpoint. The alphas actually look like the, we intend the real product to look. So these are looks like, works like prototypes. Uh, we unveiled those here in Eugene and then in Portland um, in the middle of the month. All right. And we're uh, just doing some final polish work on them this week in preparation to take them down to California for a road tour. Uh, but I will say in terms of the ride experience, it just it blows away anything we've done before. It's a, it's a very engaging ride. Uh, just you're you're right there in the world. Um, the way the cage kind of comes down, it, it feels like you're in a, a fighter jet or something like that. Right. And because of the shift in ergonomics and controls, you just take you take a much more active uh, an, an active role. Your feet are planted, so you can shift your weight more easily. Um, and it's just it's a it's a really fun ride. Uh, the for for the second passenger, it's also it's now much easier to get in and out. It's it's you just step in, step out. Where before we had you kind of had to go in through the front seat, and it was a 
it was a, a, a gymnastic effort to get your second passenger in the vehicle. Um, now it could actually, you know, Gen 8 could easily be used for things like vehicle sharing or, or uh, ride share like uh, Uber or Lyft or something like that. Right. Well, that, that just brings up a good question. So, I mean, traditionally we kind of think of, you know, when you build a car, you're thinking of a particular customer that they're going to buy that car and it's going to sit in their driveway and so on. The kind of vehicles, I don't see them as, as necessarily, I mean, there's going to be people that, you know, there are people that bought the Sparrow. Right. Um, so you're going to have that, that group, but you're actually aiming for this other market. So I'm wondering if, if uh, in, in thinking about how you're going to market this, is this something that actually makes more sense in an Uber kind of car share type of situation rather than, you know, selling one off to, you know, to interested uh quirky, if you will, buyers. Right. I, 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 don't th I, I don't think it's either or. Okay. Uh, so so we, if you look on the website, we've got a version of the platform we call the Deliberator that's a one seat with a lot of delivery storage room in the back. Right. Um, <clears throat> that, that could be everything from pizza delivery to medical supplies to auto parts to just, you know, ripping around town with your your brand name here, right? Uh, so kind of a, any, anything from a mom and pop business to a corporate fleet uh, to a government fleet. Uh, there are vehicle sharing opportunities, whether it's something more like you know car to go or right. something more like Lyft or Uber. Uh, but then the the real purpose of the product is to match the way that people use cars today, but deliver a solution that's way more affordable, way cleaner. Uh, much lighter weight, much easier to park. So if you're living in San Francisco or Brooklyn or Shanghai, yeah, you think think about San Francisco where you have these tiny parking spaces in between yeah. driveways yeah, that exactly. you can park in. Well, yeah. the SRK can park in those spots. So that's a huge deal for the urban driver. And it's not so much, you know, we're, we want it to be outside of the quirky mobile category. And, and that's really what doing all of that product testing uh, against consumers was all about is that we put we built a one seat vehicle that was our our first vehicle was one seat and we put it in front of people and 99 percent said i will never buy a vehicle that has only one seat right even though i drive by myself most of the time right you know and, and especially thinking of an electric vehicle it's really fun it's got great torque it's a very engaging experience the first thing you want to do is sure. go to a friend or your sweetheart, yeah. you know, for a nice ride, and and so the the actually the guys who 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 built the gizmo and, and turned that into a company uh, came to us early on in the process, and they said if we had one thing to tell you, if we had just one piece of information to communicate, it Make would be it two place, two people, yeah, and and it was that sort of feedback mechanism that. Um, you know, really drove the development cycle in order to find something that was not a small niche solution, but really would be broadly applicable as long as we could get the cost right. Right. Well, and let's talk about that. You're talking $11,900 for a base unit. Um, yep. As I understand, that's pretty much, in the Gen 8, that's pretty much the open cabin yep. uh, with the acrylic, a, looks like a, acrylic roof over it. Um, yeah, you got Full fairing overhead. You've got you know the corner windows, windshield. So even the base model actually does a really good job of protecting you from the the weather. Uh, but we'll also have upgrades like a like a golf cart or an ATV or a Jeep or whatever. You'll have you know full enclosure that you can put on when it's when it's nasty out and take off when it's a beautiful sunny day. Okay. Uh, sort of. So if I were going to do you know I wanted one of those in Nebraska. I'm looking outside at our first snowfall, <laughs> and it's, uh, I haven't checked the temperature, but it's probably somewhere in the, the you know, mid to upper 20s out there right now. Um, what, what would I be looking at to get that all enclosed? And then I assume you'll probably have battery pack options and things like that. So if yeah. I wanted to go full blown, all the bells yeah. and whistles. You know, so, so the first step up that you'd be looking for, if, if you want that full enclosure, now I would say it's, it's actually been 
pretty frigid out here in Eugene uh, the last few days, and I've been driving around just wearing you know what I would wear to stay warm outside. Okay, I wear and and it's absolutely no problem. It's a ton of fun to drive it when you're when, even being in that environment. But let's say you want to have the full enclosure uh, panels. We're estimating right now that's probably going to be around two thousand okay. additional for those, including a, a heating source. Um, if you want a longer range battery, if you base model goes 70 miles, if you want to go 130 miles, that's probably going to be another $2,000. So even a, you know, fully loaded, you'll, you'll max it out around, you know, low twenties. Okay. But, but the, the, the goal from day one is to have that $11,900 base model be a very practical daily solution. All right. Um, you know, it, and, and then have a lot of ways that you can make it more, more particular to you, better for you, but, but still in most climates, most of the time, uh, even the base model will be a, a really good solution for daily transportation. Are you, are you worried about, you know, I mean, you can go now literally and buy a used Nissan Leaf for, you know, under, I mean, basically what I'd be paying for, you know, one of your vehicles. Does that, does that sort of development kind of concern you as, as far as, you know, taking the business forward and being successful? No, I, I've not. The, the point of getting to the price point that we're at is that the product that we're building is affordable for the vast majority of folks out there. Uh, at some point, when, when, when the price is equal across a bunch of different products, then you have to say, well, which one is a better solution for me? Right. What are what are my criteria? And you know, for me as a as a consumer, one of the things I am now very concerned about is what's my footprint in the world. Right. right? And it's not just about having an electric drive. Uh, it's about having something that actually matches in terms of resource consumption uh, is a better match for what I need. Right. Uh, and that is about moving. To me, that's about moving beyond the car. So. If you're buying a Nissan Leaf, you're still buying a car. You're still, you've got 3,300 pounds of stuff. It takes up a lot of space. Um, and if you need all that space, you're, you're schlepping four people around all the time. That's, that's fine. But if you're driving by yourself, it's that much harder to park. It's that it takes up that much more energy, takes up that much more room in the driveway. And the, the, from just a pure experience factor, I think we're going to deliver on something that is yet again a more uh, visceral, enjoyable, entertaining drive experience. Okay. Let me ask you about distribution. Uh, you know, how are you going to market? How are you going to sell the vehicle? And then what is your, you know, your war plans regarding warranty, service, things like that? Right. So distribution model is direct, following on the heels of Apple and Tesla. Uh, you know, you put in an order on the website. Vehicle shows up in your driveway. Um, we we plan to have a, a number of different ways to showcase the vehicle. So whether it's a kiosk at a mall or a small footprint retail store uh, or a gallery type display, um, all of those are are in the plan in terms of the the sort of physical market rollout. So you'll be able to go somewhere relatively local to where you are and touch it and take a test drive. Um, decide if you want to buy, but the, the actual purchase process is online. And then in terms of warranty, we're planning a standard three year, 36,000 mile warranty, uh, and then service through partners. So, okay. uh, and, and we're in the, in the early discussions with a number of potential, you know, kind of nationwide service partners, uh, as well as in areas where we, we don't have good coverage there, we'll partner with local folks. Okay. But, but one other aspect of, of the SRK is it's just very it is a very simple, refined design. So if you if you think back to you know the early Volkswagen bug where you could you know buy the service manual and and fix it yourself, right? It's going to be that sort of a model uh, where the the um, the ability it, it sort of brings back that old ability to work on your vehicle yourself, um, where uh, you know. Today's cars are dozens of computers and parts buried under things, and you, know, you really have to have an advanced degree to work on them, uh, and at least a lot of diagnostic hardware that's not yeah. in typical reach. Yeah. Um, so you're going well. well 
I had a question come to mind and now of course completely slipped uh so oh yeah so where are you then in terms of actual manufacture of the vehicles when if i put i think you've got a i can put a deposit down on the vehicle that's refundable so when are you guys really anticipating uh starting to manufacture and, and start deliveries so we're going to be we're, we're going to be in a fairly continuous manufacturing mode as we are building up to true series production. Okay. Uh, over the course of next year, we plan to build 50 pilot vehicles. And where the alphas right now still have a lot of, um, uh, you know, hand-built pieces, uh, 3D printed parts, um, uh, we're, the, the pilots will all be production intent. Okay. So they will, they'll be tooled up, uh, castings for the gearbox, uh, stampings for various pieces, uh, tooled up glass instead of polycarbonate for the windshield, you know, kind of on down the list as we, and, and those will, will use those as both uh, a continued in market push as well as just a lot of on road uh, testing for the actual production model with the goal of being in production right around the end of next year. Okay. And these are classified uh, in most states, I believe, as motorcycles. So I'm assuming you're going to yeah. have to have a motorcycle the, endorsement on your license to be able to drive one then. The, typically not. Oh, okay. Uh, so so the, it's a, the funny thing about the classification is it's actually the federal code that defines the vehicle type. Uh, three wheels on the ground means it's a motorcycle, uh, but uh, vehicles are licensed and registered state by state. And most states have three-wheeled vehicle carve-outs of one kind or another that exempt you from licensing or helmet requirements based on the, the different verbiage around the, the description of the vehicle. Right. So check with uh, so, your local state to see what the uh, right. requirements are. So, and, and part of it, we'll have a section on our website here soon that does a full state-by-state -state of you know, what, what is the current regulatory landscape look like? And then what are we shooting for? Um, Oregon and California, where they're, they're going to be two of our very early markets, uh, don't require helmets, don't require motorcycle endorsements uh, for the, the Arkimoto as it stands today. Okay. Um, and then, you know, but that, again, that varies by state. The reality, though, is if you do need a motorcycle license, it's really not a big deal because you can take the skill test with the vehicle. Right. So... You don't have to learn how to counter steer and lean and all that kind of stuff. Um, you just take your SRK down to the DMV and do the skill test, get your endorsement, and you have a, a lifetime of really enjoyable, clean driving ahead of you. Okay, very cool. Well, thank you, Mark, for taking the time. Uh, wow, we've been 35 minutes, about five minutes over what my goal was, but uh, it's all very right. good information. And I do so much appreciate your taking the time. It took us a while to work out some of the technical bugs, but uh, I think it was all worth it. Well, yeah. Thank you again for having me on the program. Uh, Got to get you. Uh, Got to get you in the driver's seat here sometime soon. Absolutely. First right chance on. I get to come back to Eugene. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Bill. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.